Welcome to CMIF1 Financial Operations, Chapter 13, Statement of Cash Flows. You are all familiar with an annual report with a complete set of financial statements, which comprises Statement of Financial Position, Statement of Comprehensive Income, Statement of Cash Flows, what we'll be looking at, and you have a full standard on that, IS7, Statement of Changes in Equity, and of course, Notes to the Financial Statements. So the focus of this chapter is on one key financial statement, the cash flows. In today's world where you have the financial crisis and companies struggling even to survive, you would argue one of the most important, if not the crucial element of companies' um, sustainable sh uh, future for the short term was an aggressive monitoring of cash flows. And statement of cash flows has become by far one of the um, most important financial statements in today's world. I'm not saying we don't consider those two sta statements uh, important, but the emphasis placed on statement of cash flows is um, phenomenal, particularly in these times. So what is, I'm not going to define what is cash, but what is a cash flow statement? First of all, there are two methods um, to prepare a cash flow statement, direct or indirect method. Irrespective of which method you use, you're going to have three categories of cash flows. And I think it would be nice to look at that if you go just down a little bit into your CMIF1, we mentioned here what's the difference between direct method and indirect method. And the difference will be only at the level of operating cash flows, which is one of the three categories present in the cash flow statement or statement of cash flows. The other two categories are financing cash flows and investing cash flows. And financing cash flows. Now the only part that is different whether you use direct or indirect method is operating cash flows. For operating, uh, operating cash flows under direct method, you will have basically just to look at inflows and outflows from operating activities. And as you know, the key inflow from operating activities is cash received from customers. And the key outflow would be cash paid to suppliers and I would say here salaries. That's a major outflow, operating outflow. Of course, you may have any other cash payments and then you get the operating cash flow. That's the direct method. However, if companies choose to use direct method, they will still have to prepare a reconciliation, which we'll touch upon just now, which in effect is the operating cash flow calculation from the indirect method. So in other words, you choose to do direct, but you end up doing indirect in the notes to the financial statements anyway for the components that are different. So many companies in practice, you will see if you look into the financial statements, you will see indirect method used. And here it comes, an indirect method, which is quite common to be examined in the exam as well. If you look, you have, you are supposed to find, identify th the three categories of cash flows I mentioned. I'll just briefly give you the big picture, operating, investing, and financing cash flows. And there is a very, very nice part at the very end of the cash flow statement, which shows you the net increase, decrease, net increase or decrease in cash and cash equivalents, um, which basically is the sum of the three categories sum of three categories above and here well cash you know it's your cash deposit in the bank cash equivalents are any highly liquid investments you will find them in current assets just very close to your cash as a line and that could be maybe certificate of deposits um, basically cash deposits for th three months and so on um, investments that you can liquidate virtually immediately and convert them into cash before i dive into each category one thing which is fantastic about cash flow statements is that at the end of the statement, you have to do a form of reconciliation and you're going to say, okay, with the sum of the three categories of cash flows, I got the movement of cash in the period. 
I do know the cash and cash equivalents brought down at the beginning of a period where from, from the bank statement at the start of the year. I know the cash and cash equivalents at the end of the period. So I want to make sure the drawdown figure plus minus movement equals the carry down figure on cash and cash equivalents. And if this doesn't happen, there must be an error. In other words, if this movement here, you don't get to the correct figure or if you go more into detail, one of the categories of cash flows is not correct, you will never have this equation working. So this is a reconciliation at the end, which gives to stakeholders more reliability on the information in the cash flow statement, because the drawdown and carry down figures on cash and cash equivalents is present into your bank statement, isn't it? And that's a third party independent um, piece of information. Now let's have a quick look at what is operating cash flows. This bit here, it's added on by EXP just to help you work in your mind um, the journey between the PBT and the PBI team, which you need to consider is from here where it starts the statement of cash flows really. So what you have to do is to look at PBIT and to take the adjustments, various adjustments, non-monetary adjustments, and we'll go through all of them so that you reach from an operating cash flows to, after this journey, uh, sorry, from an operating accounting profit to a net operating cash flow. So what are you gonna take? I'm gonna take the PBI team, and the first thing you could remember is depreciation. Now. What remember your journey is from an accounting figure to a cash flow figure, operating cash flow. In this accounting figure, you have numbers that got in there based on accounting principles and not based on a cash movement as such. So take depreciation for an example. Depreciation, it's you know very well what it is. It's further to the accrual concept, it's a matching of the cost to the revenues that a non-current assets generate to a business. However, in terms of when there is a movement of cash flow in relation to that non-current asset, pretty much it's on, a, on its acquisition when you pay and on its disposal if you get any money. Hence, depreciation is purely accounting, no cash flow movement in that expense. So it's with a minus in the profit before interest and tax, right? To get to profit, it's a minus. If I want to make it disappear, to neutralize it, you must come with a plus isn't it? So it's here with a minus to make it disappear, you come with a plus. If you think of impairment losses, similar discussion, it's with a minus in PBIT, come with a plus and make sure you neutralize it. So all non-monetary elements, you'll try to, to neutralize them now. Now, another thing you want to look at is disposal of non-current asset. Everybody knows that when you sell a car, let's say, you have selling price less net book value of that car at date of disposal. That takes you to profit or loss, isn't it? Uh, on the disposal of that car you sold. So assuming you have a profit or loss, have a look here. Selling price is cash, great. However, MBV is pure accounting figure, isn't it? It's no movement of cash flow. Therefore, this profit or loss, it's an accounting figure. So you want to get rid of this figure, profit or loss, and to account for the selling price in the relevant section of the cash flow, because this selling price is the only element, assuming it's cash, that really has any relevance and is related to the cash flow movement, which you try to capture in this statement. So what you're going to do, you're going to say, I'm going to take that, let's say it's a profit figure, make it disappear. So let's make it disappear, neutralize it. If it's in PBIT with plus, so if it's a profit, if it's a gain, I'll have to come with a minus. And if it was a loss on the disposal, it's a minus in PBIT. So to make it disappear, you come now in adjustments with a plus. So hopefully this makes sense, but the story doesn't finish here. If you neutralize the gain or loss here on the disposal, 
that disposal must have something to do with investing, isn't it, cash flows? So that is connected immediately with any proceeds from sales of non-current assets. That's the only element of cash flow from that particular transaction. So neutralize the profit there, but come and put the proceeds in the relevant section. Okay, good work if you follow that through, hopefully. And what else important we have here in operating cash flows? I will just highlight this working capital part, which is very important. And maybe you can imagine that any movement in inventory create an impact in cash flow. Any movement in receivables, the same, create an impact in cash flows and movement in payables. So let's see how exactly that happens. Imagine I'm going to take your brought down, carry down figures. And let's say your inventory is 100 at the start of the year and becomes 150. So the movement 50, is that good news or bad news for your cash flow? Well, stock increasing is always bad news because you block cash. So because I have an increase, I will have a bad news, a minus, more cash blocked into the business, into the stock for 50. The same discussion with receivables. If these figures were for receivables, any increase in receivables is bad news because you're not collecting quick enough money to bring them into the business, to have them as an inflow. So an increase in receivables, again, is bad news. And the payable side is the other way around. If your payable increase, in theory, it's fantastic news because you negotiated great terms with suppliers, you hold on into cash, and use it into business. So any increase is the other sign, isn't it, in payables? It's good news. Now, for consistency purposes, what the standard is doing is taking after cash from operation interest and tax presented separately. Like you remember, you see that in statement of comprehensive income, but we're looking for the portions paid, and in the exam, you may have to do a form of incomplete record calculations. If some of you looked at the topic, you know what I'm saying. If not, make sure you recap that based on your notes you used. And you're going to have interest paid and tax paid. You don't care about tax liability or interest liability, but the proportions paid. And then finally, you get to cash from operations net. Now, this is the most sophisticated section. If you got the mechanics of it, what you're trying to do is to convert from an accounting figure to a cash flow figure from operations and how you do it with several adjustments, you'll be fantastic on this topic. It's highly relevant, highly examinable. Now, there are two more sections I would like to present to this um, cash flow to you and that is a section with investing cash flows and as you can expect here you will have cash flow from any investing activities and that could be any form of non-current assets so it's both when you purchase them so you make payments and also when you sell them when you make uh, when you receive cash from it and then you'll have a net investing cash flow if you take any cash flow from um, an annual report from the website, you will see here immediately if companies invested in that particular period of time, how much they invested. And sometimes this shows you, okay, even if it's an adverse impact, obviously, because you're making investment cash outflows, hopefully this pays off in the next years. You are judging in that particular context the company. Now, if you look at the financing for cash flows, what you have here is all the cash flows related to the way the business finance itself. And there are really two major ways to finance yourselves. Own money, okay, so own capital, and very good. If you thought about it, borrowed funds. Easy, isn't it? So what you will have here in financing cash flow is any inflows or outflows from loans. So if I'm taking any loan, it will hit here, new loans raised, you see. If I'm paying loans, repayments of borrowing is going to be here. Government grants received, if we receive anything for free, uh, fantastic, we'll put it here. Any movement in capital, if the, in other words, if I increase the capital, will hit the cash flow from financing activities. Dividends paid, if we get, if we pay any dividends, obviously we pay in respect of financing activities will be here. So anything to do with sources of finance, which are pretty much two broad um, categories, will fall into this place. And finally, you have subtotals for each category and you're ready to get your net movement in cash and cash equivalents. And then you'll put your brought down, carry down figure on cash and cash equivalents here to do the reconciliation I spoke a few minutes ago. I hope you find this helpful and uh, good luck in your preparation for the exams and really best of luck in your exams.